Um, the type, slightly changed the title of this to um, Insights from, from Stakeholder Narratives. I mean, we, we wanted to present with some of our uh, findings on the, um, the primary research we've, we've conducted on the channel, some of our with, with some of our stakeholders. So what I'm presenting this afternoon is really <coughs> what the sort, of, the sort of things that the stakeholders have, have told us about various aspects of this project the planning and delivery process. Um, but before we, we talk about that, I'm just going to run very quickly through the Omega study main aims and research questions, the sorts of uh, broad, uh, a broad overview of the methodology and an introduction to some of the research methods we're using. John will talk about the pre-hypothesis data collection process uh, and also the use of, of software to interrogate the data. And I'll round up with uh, a series of slides on some of the initial results that are going to come out. So, the Omega Centre, the, the overall research question, my apologies to anybody who's heard this before, but important to, uh, to kind of refresh our memories really to three uh, principal questions to establish what constitutes a successful mega urban transport project, to look at how well risk, uncertainty, and complexity has been treated, and also to look at um, the importance of context in making judgments about success and about the treatment of risk, uncertainty, and complexity. And coupled with that, um, there are a series of clarification questions. You know, what does an MUTP mega urban transport project constitute? Lots of people have different thoughts on that. You know, what are its boundaries, what are its typologies? Um, we're also are keen to establish which stakeholder perspectives are to be investigated and how they should be investigated. And fundamentally, you know, how, how you try and identify generic and context specific judgments of success and the Um, well, we're looking at uh, clearly some of the traditional criteria for judging success relating to cost overruns, completion dates, and so on. But we felt it important also to look at the if you like, success relative to the emerging 21st century agenda relating to visions of, of sustainable development. And we're also keen to look at the processes and approaches to strategic thinking, particularly the levels of competence displayed in the treatment of risk, uncertainty, complexity, and context in the, in the uh, arena, if you like, of decision making. Um, and these are some of the tests that we are applying, this is very much a, a high level view of it, it's somewhat more complex than this, but uh, essentially we're, we're applying uh, four basic tests. We're looking at the initial objectives of the project, how well it's, it's met those, and indeed uh, how well projects have met some emergent projects that have become uh, attached to the project over time. It's certainly the case uh, for CTRL. The initial objectives were very different to those that, that emerged over time. Um, sustainable development uh, visions are the extent to which the, the project contributes to current thematic 21st century visions of sustain sustainable development. We've commissioned a series of papers from our partners, I'll talk a little bit about partners in a minute, um, who, who have uh, taken certain themes of sustainability and looked at those on a, on a global basis. Um, <coughs> test three really is, is about, uh, it's split into four component parts, but essentially about the treatment of risk uncertainty and the complexity of the context, the planning and appraisal and evaluation of these projects. Uh, and finally, a synthesis really of, of test one to three with a view to uh, pulling out some key lessons and guidelines relating to individual case studies and in relation to uh, the full spectrum of, of 30 case studies that we conducted. And finally, we're interested in, in success from whose perspective because lots of people have lots of different perspectives about success and, and failure. So that's one of the things we are trying to, to address here. Who are the, the winners and who are the losers with, with these projects? You can see in the red, <coughs> red box up there, what we're talking about today is one aspect of the, uh, the overall methodology, what we call the pre-hypothesis narrative pattern analysis. Uh, the top box there, as I mentioned, we have commissioned a series of papers from our partners on the background to mega urban transport project planning, and also, as I mentioned, sustainable development challenges. Uh, we've been mining 
uh, secondary source data to build up a project profile of each of our 30 case studies. And we are conducting uh, for each of the case studies a uh, kind of traditional uh, hypothesis led uh, approach uh, to, to individual learning, to structured interviews. Um, at the moment, we are pretty well in the, the stage, we're just starting the analysis and synthesis stage, um, which the project uh, case studies, 30 case studies, will be completed by the end of the year, and the centre will be taking uh, forward the, uh, the synthesis process. Um, our partners, as you can see, we have, well, we have uh, the network as a whole comprises 10, uh, 10 partners, uh, two in Asia, one in Australia, six in Europe, and the United States. And these are just some images of some of the projects that we're, we are looking at. And this will be on our website if, if you need to uh, have a look at it. There's also project profiles uh, that we've compiled on, uh, on each of these projects on the, uh, on the OMEGA website. Very self-explanatory. Uh, the UK case studies uh, shown at the bottom there at CTRL was our first one. We're looking also at the M6 toll road and the Jubilee line extension. Uh, quite excitingly, the USA are looking at Big D, pretty uh, controversial project. Um, I'm now going to hand over a very brief overview of, of where we hope to be going and what we're trying to do. Um, I'll hand over to my colleague who will talk you through the uh, approach to the green hypothesis uh, investigations and, and essentially what it comprises. So, um, Phil earlier mentioned that we were looking at the two methods of the regular and the slide. Yeah. Uh, the traditional method and then the pre hypothesis for uh, collecting data. So, I'm talking about the pre hypothesis phase uh, where we use a series of naive interviews, uh, which were unstructured interviews with prompted questions and hybrid storytelling interviews to collect data from a number of stakeholders uh, related to the CTRL. So, pre-hypothesis research, what is it? Uh, it's built on the learning techniques from knowledge management, uh, cognitive science, narrative analysis, and complexity and anthropology. Um, helping us on this is a company called Cognitive Edge, who developed a lot of the software I'm going to show you in a minute, and helped us with the methodology. Uh, the, the methodology comprises open discovery using narrative, and the narrative can be captured in the form of stories or anecdotes, uh, illustrations of images, uh, video, uh, and, or clippings from newspapers, this sort of information available in the public domain. Uh, all these uh, items are called in terminology sense making items. Now, uh, for the data collection, we try to consult a diverse range of stakeholders. Uh, we didn't use a stratified sample as part of the methodology, you don't need this. Uh, we're really looking for extremes, the supporters, or the objectors of the project, and uh, to give us does that well, uh, so that we can see the project from multiple perspectives. And it was important to focus on uh, our stakeholders' experiences rather than their statements and opinions. Uh, one of the key uh, principal tenets of, of the research hypothesis research is hypotheses are not formed and tested up front created after analysis of the narrative data. Uh, so why, why have we chosen this approach? It's based on the fundamental principles of how humans share knowledge uh, through storytelling. Uh, because of people are telling stories, uh, it places the information uh, in context. And we found all the stories that our stakeholders told were very contextually rich. Uh, it avoids cognitive bias, uh, hypotheses uh, blind you to new insights, because we, uh, because our pre-hypothesis interviews were a series of open-ended questions, we, we weren't, we were trying not to lead people. Uh, reducing research bias, avoids leading witness, avoids reinforcing previously held assumptions, and uh, we hope that our interviews focus on what the interviewee thinks is important, uh, not what we thought. So, the application of uh, the pre-hypothesis research to the uh, Omega program 
we're using it for all 13 international case studies, which Phil has just showed you. Uh, all the data will be consolidated in one database. For each of the 30 case studies, we are looking to collect between 10 and 15 interviews. Uh, so that will give us hopefully 320 to 480 uh, interviews in total at the end of the project. And for the CTRL, we interviewed 27 people, uh, ranging from engineers, transport consultants, development managers, politicians, planners, academics, and uh, local government, rail operators. Now, from the CTRL, we gathered uh, around about 250 sense making items from those interviews. Hopefully, we'll end up with 2,500 to 4,500 uh, to put into the database, which we'll analyze with the software I'll show you in a minute. So, uh, an idea of the prompting questions we use. Uh, question one, uh, looking back, what in your mind were the most pivotal events that shaped the uh, CTRL project? These could be turning points or triggers of significance, not necessarily project milestones, please consider. Or an example of another question was, tell me about a time when this project was best for So, there are even ended questions you can consider. Uh, once we gathered the, um, well, we, during the interview, we taped each of the interviews. After the interview, we transcribed it, uh, broke the interview up into a series of sense making items, and then asked the, each interviewee to uh, index these, these items against a series of filters. We'll show you these in a moment, but for the methodology, filters can be uh, archetypal characters, themes, archetypal situations, uh, questions about the anecdotes, such as the time of event, the location, uh, roles, emotional intensity, or questions to do with demographic uh, data about the teller, uh, such as their role or involvement in the project. So this is just a, a shot of some of the events that we're capturing uh, the country and project the interview is talking about. If it was their own experience or if it was a newspaper cutting, uh, some idea of the emotional intensity, how did the story make you feel, elated, proud, hopeful, angry, when did this uh, event occur, we asked them to tick the boxes on a, on a timeline, and then to give the story a rating against a series of themes, the themes on the top, and situations on the bottom, I'll read out some of these if you can't see them, things like public sector power, was the story about public sector power, private sector power, political will, leadership, uh, technical solutions to one see problems, issues, and then down in the second category there, uh, situations such as project startup mobilization, uh, if it was a story about agreement about uh, project specifications, a uh, story about alleviating project impact. And then there's a third uh, section here, which is related to uh, risk uncertainty and complexity, and information about uh, the interviewee's role in the project, uh, if they were influenced decision makers, influenced project stakeholders, or opposed the project, uh, supported advocates of the project, and then information on what the interviewee uh, does, if they're in the private sector, public sector, or the government uh, organisation. We broke each of those three down into, into subcategories such as entrepreneurs, uh, business people, uh, business technical advisors, uh, contractors. So once all that data was indexed, uh, it, we then ran through it as two, two programs, which I said they were developed uh, by a consultant called Cognitive Edge. The first one is called Sensibility Collector, which is really a um, system, graphical user inf uh, interface, running over the top of the database, which just allows us to input the data. Uh, it's primarily designed uh, to allow this type of data to be collected via the internet by just emailing questionnaires out to people that we found that it was much better to do it space to face. And the second piece of software uh, called the Sensibility Explorer is really, well, it contains a range of analytical interrog interrogation tools uh, to allow us to get the most out of the database. Uh, it makes extensive use of visualization to allow complex patterns uh, and exceptions to be discovered. In the course of SA, um, I've highlighted in the bottom, uh, it can combined with aim to combine information processing uh, capability of computers with the pattern-based uh, intelligence of humans. 
So this first shot here is just a, a centimetre collector, graphical user interface. Uh, each anecdote was an uh, input uh, via uh, this, this piece of web-based software. And it goes up to a uh, database and is extracted. Once it's all been input, you, you can extract it out, and feed it into the second piece of software, and explore it. Uh, here, there are, there are an array of tools which can be used to interrogate the data. Um, I'm just going to show you some screenshots from the two which I've highlighted and read the uh, cluster tool and the graph tool. Um, so, really, we had two of them. The data I'm going to show you now is from 250 cents items. Uh, well, some of the other tools we'll find more useful when we have a larger data set, which we've completed in all 30 projects. So, uh, the SenseMaker Explorer graph tool, uh, it's really used for detailed analysis of the relationships filters and bring up all this prompting question. Uh, it allows the analyst to examine patterns and correlations uh, against all of the uh, filters that I showed you earlier. We have 53 filters. And we can give you some uh, sort of summary statistics which will be output uh, for each of these uh, relationships. So looking at the data, uh, that's a matrix of 53 uh, columns and 53 rows of the indexes. And from this, uh, you can start to see which of the um, filters are, have a strong correlation with other filters. And then when you find something, you can, you can zoom in and have a look and see, the, uh, see, if, there, well, see if there are any significant correlations in, in that data. So for example, there I have private sector power, and that was found to be quite significantly correlated against uh, agree, reaching agreement on project financing funding, use of private sector money, financing project development, visions and ideas, which you can go through and look at each of the relationships. We had a bit of a problem here because the software found a large number of significant correlations, uh, so it's quite a large amount of work to go through this and make sense of the data. The second tool which we found very useful is this cluster tool which allows you to map the interactions between different filters. So from this previous uh, graph tool, we were able to find, say, the strongest correlations. And we would take five or six we were interested in to look in further detail uh, by grabbing the, the, um, the filters from the top left hand box there and dragging them onto the screen. And then it shows us the relationship between the data. Each one of those blue dots is a sense-making item. Uh, the, I should say that the yellow, the writing highlighted in yellow, are the filters. <coughs> so here you can start to look at uh, for clusters in the data set, or as I've highlighted here, this was an exception. So it was one data point which was only um, related to, say, uh, political will, major changes in project scope, and alleviating project impacts. Or you can look for clusters up there that is a cluster related to a political will, leadership, and use of public money. Um, as you say here, the, the easiest way to look at this data is to grab one of the uh, yellow boxes there and to start moving them around and to see which data points follow. So there you can see a series of lines. I've highlighted uh, political will, and they are the data points related to political will. I can then go over to the right hand side and look. At, uh, the use of public money, start moving that around, and I can see data points which are connected to both political will and the use of public money. From there, I can start to identify clusters. This is a screenshot showing you once I've found an interesting group of clusters, I can select those and interrogate the, or rather, look at the data underneath, which what's driving that relationship with a set of clusters. And there, as I've said, this is a small set, five or six data points, and they're all looking at physical world leadership and use of public money. Zooming in on those, they seem to be stories about uh, the public sector and the need to speed up the decision making. So that's just an example of one of the uh, sense making items which was driving, driving that relationship. So now I'll hand you back over to Phil and go through some of the uh, findings, initial findings, uh, using this, this technique. I wonder if it's worthwhile just sort of calling a whole 
there and see if, any, if there are any questions on the, the sort of techniques, as it were, before I launch into some of the um, insights that we got from. Um, was it your intention that the stakeholders should be primarily what I might call experts and professional stakeholders? We try, because there's no stratified sample, hmm. uh, I mean the, the argument being that if you have a stratified sample you introduce an hypothesis. Yeah. Um, we tried to go for a, a, a sort of fairly broad spectrum, but people who were essentially quite heavily involved in the project or had you know, quite a lot of knowledge of, of, of the project and at the same time some of the key decision makers. Okay, so it wasn't, it was never intended you know, to be pure in that sense. You know. No, but I, mean, I went through one of these interview processes like with Paul Verena had to uh, <laughs> transcribe. Yeah. Um, it's quite a complex process. If I was, I mean one of the stakeholders Perhaps on the out, more on the outside, maybe one of the people living nearby, such as in the King's Cross Railway Bay, sort of stuff that might be involved with. Um, if I was one of them, I would I would find a pretty formidable process yeah. to, to have to face. Right. So I wonder, I wonder if actually there is there is some bias in actually the method itself, in in the sort of stakeholders who might respond. Uh, well, I mean, we are, uh, and indeed our funders are fully aware of, of, of the way we've approached it. We, we did target, you know, the, the decision makers and those who had, had an influence or, or, you know, a certain not expert knowledge. If you like. So we, we're quite open and, and, and sort of honest about that. I mean, interestingly, the this process, this methodology, is more commonly used in the business environment. Um, but with um, you know everybody from from you know the Bobby on the beat to to managing directors, so it's you know it's all in the phrasing of the questions. But because the questions are really about people's experiences, yeah. rather than opinions or statements, it does kind of lend itself to application on on, on you know sort of various different levels. And interesting, I mean you know the, the, we interviewed um, politicians. They went quite a, a different take on, on the questions, and, and you know, as John said, because it places the, the responses in context, you actually start to understand a lot more about agendas, motives, and all, all the rest of it. Okay. I have a question leading on from that, which is one of compliance. Did everyone who participated in the initial interview follow on and do the coding exercise that I understand you asked them to do? Not everybody, I have to say. Um, for some, uh, especially the long interviews, I mean, some were kind of three hours, you know, it just wasn't a, a short piece of business. Um, we did ask everybody to index. Not everybody was, you know, felt able to or had the time to. Uh, I would say 60% did. Um, but again, methodologically, um, there's no problem with the indexing being done by somebody else because that's flagged up in the software that the indexing has been done by somebody else. Um, according to, uh, to Cognitive Edge, what, what the kind of best approach is that the team gets around uh, a, a PC, looks at the piece of narrative, and decides kind of commonly how it should be uh, how it should be indexed. So it's not perfect. I mean, you know, I mean art. Our experience isn't perfect in that sense, but um, you know, it seems to have, have, have bedded itself quite well with, uh, with cognitive, cognitive energy um, expectations. Okay. Um, right, I've got about uh, 10 or 15 slides here on, on uh, some of the main findings. Now, what I hasten to add is these, these are not our views, okay? so I'm not going to defend any of them. These are what we gleaned from, uh, from the various stakeholder interviews. What I should also say is that um, the narrative that we collected kind of works on two levels. It works on the level that John has explained in terms of looking at the patterns of, of, uh, of indexes and the patterns of knowledge that we created. It also works uh, if you like, in a, in a sort of old-fashioned manual sense, and just reading through the narratives and, and actually picking up a lot of a 
a lot of uh, very sensible data. Okay. What we flagged up also um, is we put a sort of red box uh, around those insights that appear to uh, be uh, starting to be replicated uh, from amongst our partners. Now I can't hand on heart say these are all cast in stone, uh, somewhat generic, because we've not got all of the, uh, the results. Okay. So we're going to start with uh, politics and the role of, of project champions. Um, and it, it became clear in all of our interviews that political influence was, was you know, fundamentally important. Um, throughout pretty well all aspects of the, of the project, uh, from you know initial specifications, the way it was financed and refinanced, to the route selection process uh, and the station selection process, and that seems to be being replicated in Japan and uh, certain projects in, in North America. Um, many saw the decision to build the CTR as a trade <coughs> politics over financial reality. Um, you know, at a pretty early stage uh, in the project, it was concluded that patronage, patronage alone you know, wouldn't make the project viable. Um, but politics played its part in pushing, pushing the project forward. Um, there are some link in, in particular Sweden and uh, Denmark, it also appears to be in the same sort of category. Um, having said all that, you know, quite a number of our stakeholders said, well, look, you know, this is the first big railway in the UK for, for more than 100 years, so it was perhaps inevitable that it would take a long time to debate in, in the political arena and to plan and, and implement it. Um, some suggested that CTRL routing you know, became a political tool and that um, you know, Tory government was keen to push the uh, project through East London, if you recall initially it was going to come into London on a uh, southeasterly route. Um, but <coughs> that it was going to be pushed through uh, East London to uh, you know, boost Tory standing in, in labour controlled areas. Um, lobbying and the role of visionary champions were perceived as being especially pivotal. Uh, I feel my hat off to, to Peter uh, in, in terms of championing the, the CTRL and the Thames, Thames Gateway as a, as a fundamental package. But other important uh, champions were seen at Prescott, which was seen as, as fundamentally a champion in rescuing the, the project in 1997, 98, 1990, whoa, <laughs> <laughs> star date, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then we uh, And that again seems to be something that's being replicated uh, in some of our other case studies uh, overseas. Um, the initial planning period seems to have been especially politicised um, and a number of the project elements such as the redevelopment initiatives in King's Cross and Stratford were essentially bolted onto the project in response to uh, very effective political lobbying. Um, but what seems to have remained a constant according to our stakeholders um, was a, a pretty cross-party notion that although there were serious misgivings about the project's viability, and you know, at that time there had been troubles in relation to the viability of the Channel Tunnel, it was going to go ahead um, as a private sector funded project. Um, interestingly also, uh, many, many of, not just the politicians, but many of our uh, stakeholders told us that consensus building at all political levels, and actually between local government uh, and central government, was seen as an absolutely vital component of the project planning. Um, this, a number of these, I have to confess, are attributed to, to just a couple of stakeholders, but I thought it was interesting because um, you know, it's, uh, well, it's just interesting. Isn't it? um, Attributes of effective lobbying were, of course, you know, I mean, the, the obvious things, access to or influence on high level decision making, but stamina and tenacity. Um, I think Michael would probably uh, agree with this. You know, people needed to be in for the long haul. They weren't going to win in a day, they weren't going to win in a year. Um, they were in it for the long game. Um, and those that were particularly successful. 
I'm thinking here of uh, particularly of Stratford. Um, the, the, the spreading out of, of the word, as it were, in terms of, of project benefits or potential benefits, um, was seen as a particularly effective tool to, to encourage buy-in from as many different uh, organisations as possible. And of course, the, the ability to present a, a clear and appealing message, particularly a clear and appealing political message. Um, and in the case of Stratford, uh, there's an antidote to deprivation. Talk a little bit about project objectives. Again, what our stakeholders told us, well, the original objectives were solely really to an international service between Paris, Brussels and London, but to do it as cheaply as possible. However, in practice, over the course of the project, a lot of different forces served to, to mould it and the interplay of stakeholder involved. Right. Oh, yeah. um, many different forces shape the project over the years. Um, so as a result, and again, this is something that uh, seems to be being replicated uh, in, with some of our other partners. Uh, you know, the objectives of the project changed over time in response to new agendas that emerged. Um, for example, the, um, the air train in New York shared by financial restrictions and changed uh, over time, as indeed the Shuto Expressway in, in Japan. Um, but again, for the original uh, project objectives, particularly the, the, on the cost side, BR under con constant pressure to, to find the least cost, irrespective of pretty well everything else. Uh, and as a number of our stakeholders have told us, uh, in the early days, in the mid-80s, and um, often involved drawing a pretty straight line. Um, irrespective of what that happens. Uh, uh, um, but of course, you know, some of these other objectives were driven by things like national prestige and, and status, and, and the obvious uh, issue there being uh, you know, the, the uh, comparison between these uh, very swish high speed French trains and the um, rather slow uh, equivalent on, on this side of the channel. Um, so the initial drive for cost minimization was, was subsequently overridden by things like national uh, <coughs> status. Um, a number of the second narrative uh, pieces, anecdotes, should I say, um, related to, to vision. And it was seen that positioning of, of CTRL as a means to promote regional restructuring and a number of other things like regeneration um, required actually quite a, a, a considerable degree of faith and strong advocacy skills. Um, you know, you might say that people kind of went out on a limb at some of the higher political levels. Um, and again, also brings in the, uh, what I said earlier about uh, consensus building. And Later, certainly in the early 90s, the relationship between the CTR and the Thames Gateway was seen as essentially symbiotic. They couldn't exist in their present form unless that symbiosis uh, had taken place. Um, what also seems to have happened, according to our stakeholders, is that the, this vision, this CTRL and Thames Gateway uh, vision, um, gave a focus for a number of other stakeholders they were able to coalesce around this vision to start to build some successful body industries. Notably, I'll say again, in Stratford, uh, Stratford Station. Um, some observations on the initial project planning uh, and appraisal approach. Um, well, again, uh, many of our stakeholders uh, said early work uh, in the, well, I suppose, mid-1980s, pursued by British Rovers, Pretty well ill thought out. They didn't. They didn't have any focus. I mean, there's also been, um, in relation to that, a number of uh, a number of people said to us that BR were pretty unwilling uh, to be given this job in the first place. I mean, they were essentially asset managers. Um, I, think I can only report what's going to be um, The planning environment for the CTL, because of all these changes in agenda, in focus. Uh, was vulnerable to change and was you know, um, <coughs> vulnerable to new ideas and a degree of ad hoc decision making. 
And the result of that was it fundamentally prolonged the CTRL planning period. Um, what had been expected, I think, to the planning period to be completed by the late 80s uh, took some time around about 92, 93. Um, but, you know, again, you might say there were some issues about the competence of BR and whether they were equipped actually to, to do the job. Bearing in mind, again, this was the first major piece of railway infrastructure in the UK for an awful long time. Um, so some said to us that, you know, the project was a, a, a victim, really, of the, of the lengthy time it took to plan and, and implement because it, it enabled or facilitated all of these new ideas and agendas uh, to, to uh, accrete, if you like, to, to the project itself. But, you know, some people said to us, well, that was actually no bad thing, um, because it gave the project time to breathe, time to bounce off all of these different agendas uh, and kind of become moulded into something that was more uh, acceptable. Most key decisions that shape the practice is probably pretty obvious given what I've just said about it being um, you know, the first geographic project in the UK for a long time. Most decisions were taken at the highest political level uh, you know, because of the size, complexity, and cost of the project, and because national prestige was at stake. Um, but these decisions were only taken after a lot of political maneuvering and consensus building. Um, and that ultimately, because of uh, that provided the basis or the foundation on which to build uh, sufficient concert, uh, consensus and momentum to be able to, uh, to, for the project to be able to uh, be built in, in, the, in the way it was ultimately designed, including you know, the fact that it became a high-speed railway, it wasn't initially, uh, and that it developed its relationship with, with regeneration of growth. Uh, the growth strategies. It would appear from what we've been told that the early route options weren't uh, properly appraised, as I mentioned uh, previously. Um, a number of BR were really not used to this, and um, some people said to us, well, look at what BR normally did was to hire a bunch of high powered lawyers to go out and kick heads or knock heads together to make sure they got their own way. Um, <clears throat> and so they were, you know, you might say, somewhat ill equipped to, uh, to, to approach approach the public. Um, and indeed, you know, anecdotally turn up to meetings with the wrong maps or the wrong lines on the wrong maps or lines that didn't meet and so on. Um, and, you know, it, it's, I wasn't around at the time, but uh, you know, there were some pretty heavy demonstrations uh, in London uh, because of hostile uh, and it was only when the DOT and the Treasury got together in the late 1980s that uh, BR and its uh, subsidiaries um, started to take a more thorough, thorough look at the, uh, at the routes. So from the late 1980s onwards, project planning and appraisal did actually become more rigorous, and, um, but at the same time was rather more open uh, to the input of new ideas and, and content concepts, um, such that uh, again, enabled, <coughs> facilitated lobbying at uh, the stations and places like Stratford and Um And then from the early 90s, a fairly short period afterwards, many ideas and agendas did come together in a more or less unified vision, is what we're being told. Um, yeah. Especially the CTRL attempts gateway symbiosis that I mentioned earlier. Um, with new and lobbying for its station in Stratford and Blue Circle. But the local authorities also played a part uh, in that, in assisting um, or being a part of the lobbying process. Consultation approaches and uh, methods. I've talked a little bit about this um, already. The early attempts at consultation by, by BR were, as I mentioned before, seen as well heavy handed, so, you know, kicked up a fuss. As I've mentioned already, the uh, BR were, were essentially asset managers, so they weren't really well equipped to do the job. Um, later consultation exercise, a number of our stakeholders have said this, 
will seem to be much more professional, uh, much more useful, and uh, led to much less hostility. Uh, and the, both the promoters, uh, latterly in, with uh, BR's uh, subsidiaries, um, and the uh, and the consortia, um, you know, with the local authorities, played a key role in the consultation exercise. And it was universally reported by many of our stakeholders. These all went smoothly, possibly. But again, something that's coming out from from some of our other uh, case studies. Uh, you know, that has to be seen in context because both the sponsors and the local authorities in helping uh, public consultation for us are already pretty well committed to backing the project anyway. Um, some of the observations uh, we've had from, from our interviewees on, on the perceived roles of the community groups were, were kind of interesting. Um, Commonly, I mean, as, as you would expect, community groups are seen as representing the needs of, of local community members who are either going to be who are going to be adversely affected in some way. Uh, <coughs> are seen as moderating the plans of developers in terms of getting what was what seemed to be best in their view to, to the local community. But interestingly, also, um, you know, in, de in delaying plans for uh, for development. Um, Essentially, so that uh, you know, uh, proper consideration could be uh, could be achieved of those plans. Um, but interestingly, also, you know, it was acknowledged that uh, that delaying kind of tactic had a varying degrees of success. Um, all stakeholders, however, uh, irrespective of whatever side of the fence uh, they kind of came from. Uh, consistently emphasised the need for actually to, to work together. It was interesting in, in our view that, I say, we did consult quite a wide uh, variety of people. Hardly anybody talked of the need to maintain a kind of confrontational, um, you know, we've got to get it kind of uh, approach. Um, and and on the back of that, there seems to have been very little evidence. Um, the community groups were perceived as being out of the loop when it came to information and uh, the ability to lobby uh, in regard to, to development plans. <coughs> okay, some institutional organisation issues. Um, well, risk averse culture prevalent among civil servants, a former civil servant myself, um, you know, there to protect their uh, political masses. Uh, is seen as somewhat uh, against the ability to, to take a long term view, particularly about things, major transport projects that take, that take a long time to uh, implement. Uh, high staff turnover in all agencies was seen as very fun, uh, fundamentally detrimental. Um, and obviously, the yeah, obverse of that, but, you know, continuity is, is seen as key. Um, many people mentioned poor sharing of. Uh, uh, because of professional silos, and a number of people talked about the need for um, managers and decision makers who are able to look at the length and breadth of the project, uh, which seems, uh, through the, the data we've gathered, to be quite a rare commodity. Um, interestingly, also, many, many people talked about the need to develop personal relationships and personality. Um, <coughs> Well, this is not uh, rocket science, but, but I'll, I'll go through it nevertheless because it is, it is quite, quite interesting. Um, a number of people talked about project programs needing to be not only realistic, but certain. That's what people wanted was certainty. Uh, much more important than, whether, than, than speed, actually, uh, because obviously investment decisions are not being made. And what was said to us was that you know a lot of the deadlines, a lot of the project program deadlines were feasibly short, simply because promises had been made to politicians. Um, and obviously, the you know, project programs have got to be fully integrated both within the project and, and across the board with other, other agencies. But again, that doesn't seem to have, have been taking place. Um, Number said. You know, these, these 
types of major projects are incapable of being tightly choreographed. It's just impossible. But that is precisely what project management techniques try and do. Um, this is what I've been told. Um, and indeed, in the political arena, you know, this, uh, politicians are presented with a, a choreographed program, and that's what they expect, and that's what they go out and live and, and talk about. Um, but if you're going to prepare and deliver fully integrated plans and programs, you've got to, it's got to be quite a lot of transparency and sharing of, of, of data. So there's a trust issue there. Project funny, well, I've covered point one, I think, already. Um, second bullet down will not be unknown to John. Um, you know, a number have speculated that the consortium's strategy was simply to, to, to win the project first uh, and renegotiate the terms later, in the full and certain knowledge that there would be sufficient political momentum to make sure the project would not fail. Um, and indeed, by the time the project was in financial difficulty in the mid-90s, you know, the belief was that it had gained sufficient momentum to, come to ensure its, its, its survival. And what uh, a number of people said to us, you know, when at that time the Labour Party was only, had only just come to power, so there was this, you know, it's not going to fail on my watch, we're only new in, 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 in to the game, uh, it's not going to fail. Um, and interestingly, notwithstanding the fact that in 2007 there was a great trumpeting of, of uh, government announcements that the project had been completed on time and on budget. The actual amount of subsidy made available through development rights at King's Cross and Stratford has never been made clear. This is what we are told. Um, a little bit about appraisal and financial modelling. I'm just running out of time. Um, key decision makers, although benefit <coughs> cost ratios and the like were referred to quite a lot, um, you know, politicians at the end of the day didn't actually rely on those. Uh, and you know, much more influential things like political influence and the impact of, of lobbying and the pursuit of a, a grand vision. But those model outputs, those financial model outputs, seem to have been more used as a means to post rationalise previously held assumptions or propositions. Um, and there seems, again, to have been little enthusiasm or, or available methodology valuing the benefits of renewable regeneration. The Treasury were very reluctant to uh, include um, the valuation of, of regeneration uh, into, the, uh, into, into the project methodologies, into the, the evaluation methodologies, or the trading methodologies, should we say, um, until pushed at the end of the day. Uh, so a number of people talked about the, the Treasury influence. I mean, obviously, they're, they're the instruction to keep costs down became a mantra. Um, a couple of people at least have said to us that the Treasury were less interested in model outputs than whether the project was actually affordable at any given point in time. Uh, many refer to the dead hand of the Treasury as, as being a significant block on new projects. Um, and it's been said to us that uh, in the BR period, the Treasury costs were under, somewhat underreported. They were restricted to those that are either known or firm and not any possible or potential costs. Uh, and they were adjusted to ensure they were within ceilings that had politically been approved before. <coughs> we also asked our stakeholders about success or failure. And I'm, I'm list these in, in no particular order. These are, are not as necessarily a measure of success or as a measure of, of failure per se. These were the sorts of things that people said to us um, you know, should be uh, the lenses through which you look at in terms of whether the project is, is a success or failure. Did it um, you know, become a catalyst for, for regeneration? Is it affordable? Um, you know, one one uh, aspect of success was, was seen as, as the introduction of domestic services, which on, on the CTR, which wasn't a, a part of the original plan. Uh, a number of people said to us, look, you know, CTRL, because of the domestic services, is going to encourage far too much commuting. Um, displacement of communities was seen as an issue. Promotion of links to other parts of the UK was also seen as an issue. I mean, interestingly, um, we know from our research that we are um, um, told to draw a plan under the Channel Tunnel Act to uh, connect the railway 
telescope parts of the UK. Um, things got kind of quiet on there. Um, creation of the lens of Europe was seen as a measure of success or failure. Success, basically. And there's some vague talk about the promotion of green travel. Um, but interestingly, little was said about promoting sustainable development as a measure of success or failure. I mean, there are to high levels of it catching it really. Um, and again, I must say that all of the stuff I've talked about is, is, re is really very high level stuff. I mean, this, um, we have a report that thick, so I've just tried to cherry pick some of the, uh, some of the main findings. Um, can I finish, um, because I've been asked to do this, to say that the next Omega seminar uh, is next Tuesday. On the history and importance of the revitalisation of the urban rail system in Perth, Western Australia, uh, by Professor Geoffrey Kennedy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Phil, and John. Uh, okay, we've got uh, maybe just uh, half an hour of questions. Uh, anyone would like to start us off? How are you going to publicise this research? In particular, have you sent a copy to David Rowland about HS2? Uh, no, we haven't. Uh, in answer to the second part, uh, yes, the um, research methodology, uh, sorry, the research pamphlets will be published via uh, the internet, uh, on our, our website. I mean, our, our principal responsibility, obviously, is to provide a final report to our uh, funders in the of our research. Yeah, I mean that's one of the, the main purposes of the project is to disseminate as much as, as much information as we can. That will probably be early 2011. Yeah. David Rowland has to report, I think, by the end of the summer, doesn't he? <laughs> well, I think we'd be delighted to talk to him, or at least Harry would, I'm sure. Strange story because uh, the, the decision to invest in Rolling Stock and also that a depot at Longside, Manchester, which for a long time bore a large um, slogan, which has now disappeared um, for obvious reasons, uh, was really taken before 
contemporaneously with the decision to go ahead with the line. So it wasn't going to make sense in, in itself because the connections before the high speed one were completed were never going to work in terms of time. Because the only way of getting Eurostars across was by a, a, a bridge of Battersea with a 20 mile an hour speed on it, which wouldn't have been very spectacular. Um, that's why you can see these trains today sitting rather forlornly in Lille Flandre operating a TGV service to Paris Nord um, after life on the GNER for some years, which is a very, very strange and sad story. But I, I'm sure that the consortium did have in mind London Brussels and London Paris, but um, there are other, I think, re reasons, including technical incompatibilities on the West Coast Main Line and also. Um, the, the, uh, the fact of very high access costs on, on the um, channel tunnel, which is at least what I've been told. But the interesting thing here is that we're moving very rapidly towards open access on the international routes, uh, and uh, I think we should see competition on, on, on high speed one. And uh, it's very interesting to see if anyone takes up the challenge of, of, of doing Manchester Paris or Manchester Brussels. I, I think it wouldn't be at all surprising if the economics can be made to work. But the other really the point I wanted to make is that I think I'm sure that lobbying was important, but it was lobbying within a framework that um, everyone involved, um, I think, strongly came to the conclusion quite early on that Stratford and Epsley were the obvious sites for stations um, because they had offered such massive regeneration potential. There were other sites continued by work, considered by a working party in 1994, including Raynham and also Midken Parkway site, but they simply didn't have the massive potential. And the, and the actual potential connectivity to the rest of the transport system, and Stratford is um, the second most connected station in London at King's Cross, and soon will be almost equal with the new connections going in. So there's a very strong case. But the, the last point to make, and I think we caught it, is that there was very, very little knowledge of the regeneration potential. There were two um, rival assessments, one made by Ida and the other by Victor Hausler for the London Bible New and New York, reached diametrically different opposite conclusions. And the differences in terms of the CBA, I can't remember now, were just bizarre. And I'm not sure that we're any further advanced. I was very amused to see in one of the professional maps this weekend, David Rowland saying, well, I'm never going to be able to justify high speed two on the basis of the conventional CPM uh, on, on time saving. We're going to have to do it on regeneration benefits. To mm. which the answer is, I'm going to find out, because we're still not better advanced 17 years later. One huge fudge factor, as far as I can see. Mm. <clears throat> I was going to ask whether, if I'm sorry, the, the issue about uh, the Treasury having these huge uh, contingency sums, whether your research has uh, helped in terms of suggesting that that is the right approach or it's too conservative, what's your approach? Um, it really hasn't come up, hasn't featured strongly, I have to say. Uh, I mean, bear in mind that this, this side of the, the research is very much an blended kind of your experience kind of thing, and, and the, the hypothesis led is, is much more focused in that sense. Um, so perhaps in that in that case, it, it isn't realizing that it didn't uh, come up particularly strongly. I think it is just seen as a, a big black box that, that kind of stopped everything happening, and, it, and that was kind of as far as we went. Um, just a question of clarification, and then a more general question. You, you mentioned these sort of pre-hypothesis interviews. Um, in this particular case study, have you already done the hypothesis-based interviews, or are they waiting until you actually open the analysis? No, we, we always do the pre-hypothesis interviews first, yeah. because we actually go back to a number of um, number of stakeholders to, to, to do the second uh, hypothesis-led. Uh, the hypothesis-led uh, data has already been gathered. Uh, we're now basically going through it. Right. So we, we are, do you have some time in between so that you can get the results from the pre hypothesis to help you formulate the hypothesis, uh, or is that come or a different route? No, we, we have tried to keep them kind of separate mm. uh, as far as possible. I mean, intuitively, you kind of can't help it, really. You do, you do obviously pick things up from the narrative, but 
in a sort of pure methodological sense, we have tried to keep them separate so that one didn't necessarily inform the other. Right. The question I was going to ask you was slightly different. That you've got um, a whole number of obviously different sort of stakeholders you were talking to that play a different part in the whole process, perhaps come in at different times, go out at different times. Um, and I just wondered to what extent we're able to look at the sort of path of this whole process, maybe path dependence. You know, if X hadn't done this at this time, then Y further down the road wouldn't have done that or whatever. Are you able to get that, that sort of dynamic in the way you do the analysis? I would have to say partially. Um, as John mentioned, I mean, each uh, each interview, each piece of piece of uh, narrative is is time based. So we do ask our our interviewees to to, to say what period of the, the project they're involved in. So that does facilitate a, a, a kind of project timeline kind of approach. Um, but it's only partial. And what's interesting in that sense is that you do see that. Um, you know, because the narrative is placed in, in context, those, that context becomes very important. So somebody who was involved in, in you know, the early 90s sees the project quite differently, obviously, to somebody who was involved in, in the 1980s. But what we've also done in our, um, our project profiles is to build a project timeline. So we're able to identify the sort of pivotal decision for this. Um, and that, again, is something that we've drawn in Led, uh, approach. But as I say, I mean, my answer would have to be on this, on, for the pre it's, it's part. But you do get chunks of narrative relating to particular periods. Now, we need to go back to the data, because we took, this is a, essentially a first cut, if you like. Uh, we need to go back to the data to look at it on a time basis. So there's still some further work to One, the other is a big one. The middle question is that you express surprise at one point in your talk that issues of sustainable development have been raised by many people. But I was wondering what it was you were expecting or had in mind that you didn't get beyond getting people out of aeroplanes mm. and trains, which mm -hmm. is a common sense thing. I thought what was the main environmental benefit of railways mm -hmm. that they get people out of aeroplanes. Perhaps like cars and something. Mm. Um, so, if you should know what you sort of thought you'd be getting. Didn't you? The other question, which is big, goes back to this question of how you evaluate projects, is how they were evaluated and how in the future they should be evaluated. And this awful problem of how you evaluate some called level regeneration, of course, uh, given that level regeneration is an extremely important issue anyway. And Um, it was only because we, I suppose, over the 
nature and number of the stakeholders we talked to. I mean, I, that's a very personal view. I mean, I wouldn't say it's shared by Harry or anybody else. I thought there would be talk about you know, the role of, of uh, CDO relative, the, relative to the creation of, of sustainable communities and so on, and things like actually, uh, King's Cross and whatever. Um, so that's, that's, it just didn't happen. Um, I, you know, I make that as an observation. Perhaps I shouldn't have expressed surprise, I'm not sure. Um, the regeneration, yeah, I mean, at the moment, all I can report is that, you know, the people we talked to certainly flagged it up, you know, the inability to, to kind of work out, A, who the winners and losers are, and B, how you, you, you value all of these other things that it proves to the, to the project. Um, lots of people flagged it up, but I, I have to say, I mean, I'm going for wrong, especially the... I'm conscious there are a number of people in the room that we interviewed. Um, I don't think anybody offered us a sort of blinding new insight. I didn't quite get your opinion that one. one. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, sorry, um, anybody else? Uh, I'm conscious that you're out a little bit later. So there are some of those who can write on the board of CTRL for. May have, I, I don't know the detail, but I suspect what may have done those train mm. paths in was the intensification of course on the, mm. <laughs> the completion price of, of the West Coast upgrade with, with, with three trains at Outsbrook and three to Birmingham. Uh, furthermore, they're all Pendolinos and the, um, uh, the conventional Eurostar would have slowed down the, <laughs> all the Pendolinos uh, at significant points and that probably may have shot the whole thing, I don't know. It, it remains a problem. It's a very complicated industry with so many franchises. Behavior going on at the time. And the other aspect about domestic services, if you like, is, is European rules compliance. Government couldn't subsidise CTRL without showing the um, <coughs> benefits of domestic terms. It's the only way into it. I think um, the interesting thing that came out to me from, from, from that presentation was the the dynamic uh, involved in developing major projects. And, and I think that's uh, a very important insight. If you, if you think of the development of the project from being a sort of a gleam in somebody's eye at some time to a mature operating you know, road railway or whatever, 
often you're talking about a period of 10 or 20 years. And that project development progress may or may not be efficient. And to get from the beginning to the end will involve uh, decisions, tasks, events will impact upon it. There'll be a, there'll be a route through. Now, there isn't a best way of developing such projects. There is no template for developing successful paper projects. And obviously one of the intentions of this centre is to, it, it is to make progress in that area. Um, it's, it's often struck me that um, the types of studies that are done that go by names like pre-feasibility or strategic or concept um, are often um, very poor, uh, particularly at the front end, um, and a lot, I believe, can be learned by understanding what was done with what effect. Not, not in a technical sense, necessarily, certainly in terms of scope, uh, but in terms of uh, involving people and helping generate consensus for a, a course of desirable action. Um, so my question is whether, as part of the case study, you are putting together that story about the types of studies that were taken, the decisions that were taken, the external influences that impacted it. It, it, in, uh, it, it can clearly be produced as a diagram but it can be quite illuminating. And maybe from that, um, and from understanding something about the types of studies, on this case study and other case studies, one might learn something quite useful in terms of how to improve it. Yeah. Um, well, as I uh, mentioned earlier, the, um, we have uh, sort of put together a project timeline for, for the CTR office for this one. But it's, it's in sort of bullet form, but it still runs to about 15 million. It seems a long and convoluted uh, story. But what we're trying to do, using um, the pre-hypothesis research and the hypothesis research, uh, is, is to determine which were the absolute sort of pivotal points um, uh, on that timeline. And to really sort of scope uh, the, the context for those pivotal points, so not, not just you know what was happening in the, in the um, around the project itself, but what was happening in the wider world, politically, financially, and all, all the rest of it. And, and that's I think we've we've kind of conceded that the, probably picking those pivotal decision made decisions or, or events is about as far as we can go to try and explain every every possible kind of line on the on the uh, project timeline. It's, it's, the event or decision on the project timeline is, is you know, a bit impossible, but we are trying to concentrate, as I say, on, on, the, um, on the main decision points or, or main event points. Um, but again, you know, obviously context, you, know, you, you always have to pose these with a caveat, context is, is, is very fleeting, you know, and it, it's sort of there at that moment in time, and uh, two, three weeks later or a month later it's, it's changed, you know. Um, so that's an interesting <laughs> point in itself, you know. But, uh, and again, you know, people have said to us there were moments in time when things were just absolutely right for something to happen. And we've kind of referred to it in our hypothesis led uh, interviews as, as the planetary alignment kind of hypothesis. You know. um, but yes, you're absolutely right. That's what we're trying to do is to understand what, what happened around those periods of events. I mean, if you think of it in the same in terms of this sort of traditional model, I suppose, which this is questioning, is you start off with a very large range of options and you sort of narrow down. Um, what seems to have happened here is you start off with a large range of options and you narrow down and then it broadens out and then it narrows down and so on. Um, so I suppose the question might be whether in the early days there were um, High quality conceptual pre feasibility sort of studies. I'm not talking big, big, big studies at all, but lots of thinking, lots of talking to stakeholders, lots of strategizing, and lots of trying to develop options. 
it's quite often what happens is people dive into at what effectively is a narrowing down because they haven't actually thought about other possibilities. And the other possibilities erupt as a result of the process. And it seems to me that you're sort of mm. describing that story, which, you know. Yeah, well, well I mean, it, interesting. I'll, I'll move into the area of the hypothesis less interviews now. Um, you know, one of, one of our hypotheses is, is called muddling through, um, which essentially describes precisely what, what you said. That, you know, the, 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 if you like, the vision for the project was, was somewhat limited in its, in its scope. Let's get from A to B as cheaply as possible, basically. Yeah. Um, but what came later was, well, let's make it high speed. That certainly wasn't on the agenda to, to start off with. Um, let's root it so that it has some, uh, uh, some beneficial impact on, on regeneration and economic growth and all the rest of it. Um, so it, it did, the research that, we, that we've undertaken does suggest that it kind of banged off all of these other agendas and, and uh, the diagram we've just <laughs> is, is absolutely accurate. Yeah. So when we had a, a sort of limited straight line to start off with and then sort of hit all of these buttons that shaped it. Can I have a comment on that? I think very quickly that I thought we were being extremely kind to BR about its early stage work on this up to age of seven, eight, eight. Because the fact that they had these proposals only surfaced because somebody made a mistake, left some lads on map, just displayed briefly at King's Cross, and showed these extraordinary diagonal lines going through the train shape at King's Cross, which turned out to be a proposal for the train line for the station. So, far from consulting anybody or having a public debate about it, they had nothing to do with it. And then it transpired that really thought about it at all. In the sense that uh, far from being a cheap option because it was a dead straight line, it was surely at that time thought to be going to be a very expensive option. Not least because of building this colossal peg platform station diagonally underneath the Grey Brothers to build the wish. If I build a better building on Westminster Avenue, it's kind of really mind boggling. Yeah. You know, I mean, you're so right. It wasn't very impressive intellectual no. process. I hired free 88. I absolutely agree. I mean, I, I, you, you're correct, perhaps I've been quite kind to be on. I mean, you know, a, a, a number of the anecdotes related to the so-called kitchen table grease proof <laughs> plan um, uh, regarding the, um, the route uh, close to Ashford that was done on somebody's kitchen table and he you know, admitted this at a public meeting and was laughed at and the rest of it. Um, we, we were told that uh, a lot of very detailed engineering work um, went into the route into King's Cross and the, the 11th hour they realised the lines didn't meet and so on and, <laughs> and so forth. Um, but I, in being kind, I, I, it's only because I'm acknowledging that I think, A, they were somewhat reluctant recipients of the job in the first mm -hmm. place and B, they just weren't equipped to do it. I think the other, the other thing that sort of goes on from that is that the um, were, I mean, their original route carved a long tunnel under Sarah. Um, I mean, it was only the, let's not forget, the, uh, uh, so in fact, the Stratford was a completely new route, of course, as uh, Peter Ball was very heavily involved in, and quite rightly moved into this um, regeneration benefit. Previous to that, it was a piece of terribly conventional draw straight, near straight line on a um, on a map going towards South London, which um, was logical in a terribly simple way for an organisation which had not ever been asked to do that. You're quite right. Um, one other interest, there's an interesting point I noticed very early on, which I pick up in this context, about um, the Tory party, Conservative government being seen to be favour East London. Yes, quite right. Um, there's also a flip side to that, and I'm sure if Tammy Bowl would have been able to join us tonight, unfortunately, on this other high speed train somewhere in uh, <laughs> Northern Europe, uh, that he would have pointed out as sort of former head of transport for Surrey County Council, there was also the, the push as well that, of course, uh, one was driving, proposing a high speed line going right through the green field south, 
for south of London in a vast area which uh, um, and a county council very strongly conservative bent and uh, thank you they did not uh, actually want it. And these are marginal Tory constituencies? I don't think they weren't necessarily marginal. There was some in South East London. There was some I don't know, I don't think of South East London, I'm talking the whole of Surrey. Oh, I'm sorry. But of course, then one might get the push pull that has the pull that's been interpreted of coming round to the East through the regeneration effect. I mean, with me, we have heard that. Um, but it, it wasn't something that, that came out very strongly in, mm -hmm. in the bulk of the interviews. And, uh, so, although the, the one about East London. I think that the one point was that Michael Hesseltine was MP for South Oxfordshire, and that, that there was, uh, as there has been more recently, um, again, a, a big debate in the late 80s about uh, housing shortage and rising housing costs. Um, he, I, uh, although he never said it in, in as many words, and I don't know what he said to you because you did interview him, didn't you? Uh, but um, he, he, he was planning to take the heat off west of London by transferring it to east of London, uh, which was quite neat. Uh, and thus he got the uh, conservative areas west of London pleased. But at the same time, the, the, the Labour boroughs in East London were displeased because they thought they were going to get something out of it. Later on, some of them became a bit um, uh, cynical about this. And I remember George Booker, the um, leader of Buckingham Dagenham saying the only um, thing that the CTRO was going to do for Buckingham Dagenham was make a noise. It probably <laughs> was true. <laughs> Unfortunately. Right. Um, um, okay, I'm very conscious of the time now. Yeah? Uh, and uh, as as I have to uh, bring this uh, interesting and uh, stimulating debate to a close, I think. Uh, probably it is time to finish there. Um, and uh, thank you all for your comments and questions.